This is Dan from the Central Privacy Outdoor Channel. And I'm just fulfilling a request from uh, my buddy Wayne over at Wildfire Knife and Tool. And he asked me basically, Dan, what's in your bug out bag? Well, you know how it is. There's nobody in the preparedness space unless you got a bug out bag or two, maybe three or four tops. Eh, plus the one in the car. Um, so when we talk about bug out bags, we have to decide what exactly we're trying to accomplish. Are we going to walk about 200 yards off the road and live our rest of our lives in that spot? Or are we actually trying to get somewhere? So with that in mind, the philosophy behind this bug out bag or ditch bag or I'm never coming home bag, which is tends to be a lot larger than this. The overall philosophy is movement. So we want to have enough things to make ourselves comfortable and to maintain our ability to move and get things done, but we don't want it so heavy that we can't move. <laughs> we burn up too much energy trying to make it to the next hundred yards. As my uh, Vietnamese mother used to say, they had a saying called Di Mao means go quickly. And you know, with that in mind, we want to carry just enough to make ourselves comfortable but not bog ourselves down. So, first of all, the bag I decided to use is a Warrior Salt Systems Predator Patrol Pack. So this is about a 3,000 cubic inch pack. It's made out of 500 year Cordura. And uh, by the way, if there's anything I go over in this video that you guys want a further review on, please leave it down in the comments and let me know and I'll be happy to uh, go further in depth in any objects inside this video. So basically the Predator Patrol Pack by Warrior Assault Systems is, I guess what they classify as an assault pack. Uh, in the Army, we used to call these three-day packs, but realistically, <laughs> You're going to have to have a tough, tough time living on them for three days with all your mission equipment. But that being said, I am a civilian nowadays, so that's not as big of a concern. And it's nice not having a drill sergeant yell at you. So let's get into the contents of the pack. Okay, getting into the main compartment of the bag here. First item we have here is a Snug Pack Special Forces Bivy. When I was planning out my uh, bug out bag, I was really heavily influenced by uh, Josh Enhart at the Green Bearded Green Beret channel. He is a absolute wealth of knowledge and if you get the chance, go on and check out his channel. I think it's probably one of the better survival channels out there. So the Special Forces Bivy is a real basic Bivy sack that has a center zip down the middle here. And basically, this is to keep your sleep system dry and you dry in adverse weather. It's going to be used in conjunction with a shelter system, but this gives you waterproof dry cocoon to put your sleep system and yourself in to stay out of the weather. And next item we have here, this is a Thermarest Trail Light Sleeping Pad. I think this was kind of a limited edition one because I haven't seen it uh, produced since. But all the Thermarest pads that I have, all four of them, have served me extremely well. They've been extremely durable and reliable. Uh, some people say, why not a closed cell phone pad? Well, closed cell phone pad will work too, but you're going to deal with a lot more bulk. And I kind of want to keep this uh, 
bug out bag rather streamlined. And as you get older, sleeping on the ground, well, it sucks more and more. So, nice thing about these thermal rest pads. is you can blow them up and they keep you off the ground. Thermal rest does build thinner pads. This pad is about an inch and a half thick. Uh, but something you want to keep in mind too is basically staying off the ground during winter. In winter, sleeping on the cold ground or snow can suck literally the life out of you. So it's always nice to have a, a nice thick pad. Like I said, everything in this bag is a trade-off. You can either have lightweight or you can have comfort. So you pretty much have to decide for yourself what are you willing to carry and how much is it worth to you when you're sleeping. Uh, me, I'm a slide sleeper. So I always start off my slide and I flat out sometime in the middle of the night. So it's kind of nice having an inch and a half thick pad. And this pad, I believe, has a 3.7 R rating, so it does a pretty good job in all seasons, including winter. Okay, next item is my sleep system. I went with an Enlightened Equipment, I believe this is called a Prodigy, I'm not sure if they still make it. It is a 30 degree rated synthetic quilt and as the uh, terminology quote implies, you don't get a bottom on the bag. So this bag is basically wrapped around your uh, insulated thermal rest pad and usually when you're using sleep systems, the bottom portion of it really doesn't do a whole lot for you, keeping you warm as far as you're going to be on top of a pad anyway. So to shave weight, I decided to go with a quilt system. One of the downsides to the quilt is you have to make sure that you're secure underneath there and so you don't get draft and heat loss. Also, quilt systems tend not to have a hood on them, so you do want to either bring a separate insulated hood if you're going out in cold weather or a uh, fleece beanie just to keep your head warm because you're losing about 20% of the heat from your head. Like I said this is a very nice light system. I believe it weighs maybe a pound and a half. I'd have to go double check that figure for you folks but uh, it has straps underneath it so I can tuck myself underneath, tuck it underneath myself and uh, strap it down to the pad. And also, the nice thing about a quilt too is when you're just stationary and you're not on the move, you can just drape it over your shoulders. Like a big old blanket. And when you're ready to go, you can just stuff it back into a stuff sack and be on your way. For the stuff sack, I decided to go with a Sea to Summit dry bag. And this dry bag allows me to keep my sleep system dry in all sorts of weather. Also, heaven forbid me and the bag, the uh, bug out bag, go into the water together, this uh, dry bag will keep the quilt perfectly dry, even if the rest of the bag is soaked, even if I'm soaked. Um, as I was mentioning in my Helicon uh, Husky jacket review, Climate Shield Apex is a synthetic material, so I know they use the term warm or wet, because well, nothing's really all that warm and wet, but nice thing about a synthetic insulation is, unlike down or other natural fibers, it doesn't soak up its weight in water, so if you fell through the ice, fell in the water, got soaked during a downpour, you could jump into this quilt, 
and probably within 10, 15 minutes, steam's going to be pouring out of it. Seeing as the fibers cannot absorb water, all the water will push off from the inside of the bag to the outside. So when it's time to go, it's nice to just grab and be able to shove everything into the stuff sack. So we just roll our stuff sack up. And we're all ready to go. This item I keep in a little stuff sack here. A set of Gore-Tex, Equix, top and bottom. So basically, this is wet weather gear. It's a multi-cam color because, well, multi-cam is cool. But sometimes you want to be seen and sometimes you don't want to be seen. And without having the ability to carry too much clothing, because we're limited on size and weight here, it's nice sometimes when your clothes get wet and you need to dry them by a fire or you need just an additional more insulation, because my sleep system is only rated for 30 degrees. So there's going to be times where I'm going to need a little bit more insulation to be comfortable. And it's nice having a wet weather bottom, which is made out of Gore-Tex here. And a wet weather jacket to wear. Um, those of you, you know, been out in the field in the army or gone mountaineering and or backpacking, hiking, whatever, and you underestimated how cold it was going to be. Well, nothing says having fun like uh, wearing everything you have with you inside your sleeping bag. Okay, next item I have is a Nalgene, which is really made by Giot Designs, stainless steel water bottle, and just an inexpensive nesting cup that goes on the bottom of the water bottle. I think I got this from Walmart for about five bucks, and it's just a real basic stainless steel cup. The Nalgene 40 ounce water bottle is stainless, and the top of the bottle is able to come off. So this uh, single layer stainless steel bottle is perfectly safe to put inside the fire. You can use it besides containing water, you can also use it to purify water by putting the water inside of it and nesting it on the coals of the fire. And to that end, I also have a fish mouth spreader. So what the fish mouth spreader does is you can make a hanging crane for your water bottle and put the fish mouth hanger spreader, excuse me, fish mouth spreader inside the water bottle and you can hang the bottle over the fire to cook your water. A uh, note of caution on this, if you do choose a stainless steel water bottle as your water container, make sure that this bottle is a single layer bottle. Do not put an insulated water bottle inside the fire. Um, putting an insulated water bottle inside of a fire will most likely result in a rather large explosion as the sealed sections of the uh, insulated water bottle will build up pressure and will rupture and explode which not good. I also have a couple of 
couple meals inside the bag because, well, I kind of like eating and I got used to eating every day. So here I have a Mountain House Pro Pack lasagna. These are absolutely delicious and they shrink pretty small. However, you do need to boil some water for them, so you're going to have to probably stay stationary for a little bit while you're cooking up this meal. On the other hand, the ever famous, ever ready meal ready to eat, uh, when we were in the uh, infantry, we used to break these down into little components and uh, you don't get a chance to sit down and eat an entire meal, so it's kind of nice to snack on the components along the way, but when you do get a chance to um, go stationary, you're able to heat the main meal with the included heater inside the MRE. So, the pack here has a little hydration sleeve in the back. And in the hydration sleeve, I carry a small water bag. Right now I have a Platypus Big Zip 2, 2 liter water bladder. Um, the Platypus brand has been really good for me, but in the future I'm looking to switch to the Source brand bladders. The Source bladders are just tougher. I run them inside my clay carrier and on the back of my um, load bearing here, but I'm just saving up to get another one of them for the back of the bag here. Uh, whatever hydration system you use, make sure it's tough because we've seen a lot of the early camelbacks burst out in the field. So some people, you know, aren't as trusting, but I've tested the hydration systems quite a bit and uh, I've had good luck with them. The only time I really had an issue with it was uh, climbing Mount Adams on, uh, in Washington State. I ran a hydration system, which wasn't the smartest thing I ever did. <laughs> Because when I got past about 10,000 feet due to wind chill, the uh, water inside the tube promptly froze. <laughs> so I was able to break up the ice before it got too bad and you know run some liquid through it. So I really, really got off lucky that time. But it's something to keep in mind if you're going to run a hydration system. What you may want to do to prevent that from happening, and I learned this quite the hard way, is get an insulated tube. Either you can use a piece of one inch tubular nylon like this to keep the tube insulated or they do sell slightly more purposely insulated tubes for this. In one of the accessory pockets right here, I carry a small bag of easy towels. These are what's well, kind of referred by uh, Canadian prepper as toilet paper tabs. They're small towels that if you hit them with a couple of drops of water, the towel expands up and you can use them to do your business. They're a lot more compact than uh, toilet paper, which I've carried rolls of toilet paper in the field and it is nice using something you're used to, but uh, in the interest of space and weight, these toilet tabs are really good. This one bag right here, runs about eight or nine bucks and it has 50 towels inside of it. So that's 50, 25 to 50 times of going to the bathroom and also being able to wipe your face down. In the lower accessory pouch, I have uh, sealed together in a vacuum sealer bag. Yeah, I got to admit, when I finally got a vacuum sealer, I kind of went out of control with it, but it's nice to be able to add on a few more layers and keep your stuff organized. So inside of this uh, vacuum sealed bag here, I have two MRE entrees, and I also have a couple of MRE heaters that you can just add a little water to and they can heat up your meal. Also inside the bag, I have a bag of chocolate protein powder. Um, one of the things when you're on the go and you're not eating 
you know, your normal caloric intake is, you're going to start to lose a little protein and muscle. So, protein powder is nice. It's not going to give you a real full feeling, but it's going to keep your protein levels up. And it's kind of a nice little pick-me-up. You know, just a little chocolate powder inside of your water, just to keep things from getting uh, boring. Also, I have a U.S. Army issued mosquito head net. Um, I do have bug repellent inside this bag as well, but I remember when we were doing some uh, field training exercises out at Fort Lewis, the mosquitoes didn't care about bug repellent in the slightest. I was wearing bug repellent all over my face and they still landed on my face and really chewed me up pretty good. The only thing you can really do to stop mosquitoes in a really bad situation is a head net. Also, it's kind of nice too that even though you're not supposed to do it, sometimes people tend to stick their head inside of a sleeping bag or if they want to zip up on a bivy bag, the little rigid hoops inside this head net here keep your bivy bag off of your face so you can breathe versus trying to sleep with something directly in your face. You can 
look up uses, outdoor uses for trash bags, survival uses for trash bags, and you will probably come up with a few thousand videos on YouTube. Um, you can use it as a drum cloth, which I would probably intend to do to protect my bivy bag. And also it will protect my uh, inflatable mattress from punctures if there's another layer between me and the, uh, the ground. So trash bag, million one on uses. Worst case scenario, if your wet weather gear fails, you can cut a hole in the bag and wear the garbage bag as a poncho. So thousand and one uses for heavy duty contractor grade trash bags. I forgot, I did throw in another pack of uh, bungee cords in here. These are little smaller ones. They have little plastic hooks on the end. I believe these are about three feet long. So, I almost forgot, I did put more bungee cords in there. So I have a lot of options on my shelter. Also, besides the four corners, you want to tie off the center of your tarp to give you a little bit of head hook. Also, in heavy rain, if you tie off the center of your tarp, the rain will fall off the sides versus having a gigantic pool of water above your head when you wake up in the morning. Or if your tarp or poncho has holes, it will probably drip on you. So it's always nice to have more options with more bungee cords. I don't know if you can ever have too many bungee cords. Next item I have is some V-Best 10 stakes, and these are the large size. I believe they are made by DAC, which is a really famous company in the outdoor space. They're really known for making, besides tent stakes, tent poles. Probably their aluminum tent poles are some of the best, considered almost a de facto standard. So they have a lot of experience in working metal. And these are their large size. And this is a pack of eight days. And you ask yourself, but Dan, can't you just carve it out of sticks? Yeah, you could if you got that kind of time. But it's nice having pre-made pegs. They don't weigh a lot. Maybe about four or five ounces altogether. They're extremely strong. And you can set them up in a hurry without having to saw up a stick, carve it, put a point on it, put a notch in it, and hope it doesn't break while you're trying to drive it into the ground. So you could make stakes on the site, but you know, depending on how big of a hurry you're in, or if it's dark, or you just are dead tired, it's nice to be able to whip out a pack of stakes and just push them into the ground. Last thing in my lower outer outside pouch. Is I took a piece of kydex and I wound about 25 yards of number 36 tar bank line. Uh, tar bank line has a breaking strength of about 250 pounds. I'd have to go look that up. But it's more than sufficient to set up uh, shelters. Uh, a lot of people use 550 cord and there's a time and place for 550 cord, but for the amount of volume you have to carry for 550 cord, you don't get a lot of cordage. So having a large amount of cordage in a really small compact package here allows me to lash more structures to improve my shelter to make my shelter stronger and to get more stuff done without having to worry you know how am i going to burn through my 50 feet of 550 cord without getting it done oops so with that thought in mind it's kind of nice not having to worry about the amount of cordage you have. And all I did is I took a piece of Kydex and I just kind of buffed out the corners and made a couple of notches there. And I just laid out 
uh, all this card bank line on my uh, living room floor and wound it up into a nice neat package. Okay, on the top outside pouch, starting with the slash zipper pocket here. Guess I didn't put anything in it. <laughs> Have some uh, first aid items that I can easily reach on the outside. Have the ubiquitous Israeli, Israeli battle dressing. And this one happens to be a four inch. Um, you can't have too many of this Israeli battle dressings. I think I'm probably gonna purchase a few more. We tend to, you know, check the box when it comes to our medical supplies, but we don't think about if ourselves or somebody we're with has a serious bleeding injury, one is ready battle dressing, probably not gonna do it all the way, so you may wanna stock up on some more of these. And I have a pair of Madison Supply EMT shears, and these are black coated with the non-stick coating here. I got this off of Amazon, and. These are really nice, high quality shears. I've seen a lot of EMT shears that have been, well, <laughs> somebody's missing a fender in a foreign country, but uh, these have been really quality. And yes, they can cut a penny. I just did it just to see, but they can. have a pair of black diamond windstalker gloves. I've used these a lot all the time. I've uh, mountaineered when camping, backpacking, and they're not waterproof in the slightest. They're just a uh, windpro fleece, but they've done a great job of keeping my hands warm. It's one of those things you don't think of. Uh, I let myself get hypothermic on a trip once, and I couldn't operate my fingers, <laughs> which if you think about everything you use your hands for, when you lose your ability to work your hands, you may be in a spot of trouble. So, you know, try to make sure you got a good pair of gloves and do your best to keep your hands warm. I have a Carhartt brand beanie here, fleece beanie. These things are great when it gets cold. You can use them to keep the head, heat from escaping from your head. And with a little bit longer ones, you can get it down all the way past your ears to keep your ears warm as well. So, again, you can't have too many of these fleece beanies. I have them in all my gear, scattered all over the place, in my daily bag and everything. So, I keep in this padded pouch here. A black diamond spot headlamp. I've had a lot of good luck with these uh, black diamond headlamps. They've been very reliable. I've taken them on a lot of climbs and uh, backpacking and hiking trips and having light at night is absolutely indispensable. Besides your everyday carry light, which is resting in your pocket all the time, it's always nice to have a headlamp because you can accomplish a lot of tasks hands-free. And, you know, we spend a lot of time where it's lighted and whatnot, but when you got into the woods and it is pitch black, if you do not have a source of illumination, well, your only option is to lay there until the daylight comes. So, also having a headlamp, like the black diamond spot here, I believe this model is uh, 200 lumens. I think they're up to 300 or 350 right now. Almost every single year, black diamond improves upon their headlamps and gets more lumens. So, you know, if you've in the store wondering, uh, I, I should have waited another five months and I would have had another hundred lumens. Well, 
200 lumens, 300 lumens, you're still good, you know. So it's really nice to have that option. Also, uh, all the black diamond headlamps have um, an extended beam, an area beam, and also, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but it has a red light. And the nice thing about the red light is you don't have to scroll through the other lights to get it. So if you turn it off in red light mode, when you turn it on again, it'll go automatically back to the last mode that you left it in. So it'll go to uh, red light mode if you, say, you want to keep a lower profile. Next I have my fire kit here. So inside of my fire kit, inside of my fire kit here, I have various methods of starting a fire. I have a couple of big lighters. I have these homemade uh, cotton discs that I made. You can take a makeup pad and you can put a little bit of uh, WD-40 or other accelerant in the middle of the pad and you can coat it with wax. All you do to use these is you break it up a little bit and you pinch a little bit in the middle and you hit it with a spark from a ferro rod and these things will burn about 10 minutes. Got a nice little tea light candle here, two of them. Three of them. <laughs> I've got a little bag of Instafire, which is, I've been testing this stuff quite a bit. It's a little bit on the bulky side, but you put this down and you've got fire for about 10 or 15 minutes and it burns really, really well. And I've also got one of the SOL Adventure Outdoor Tinder tabs. Uh, you do have to be careful with these Tinder tabs. If the uh, package gets punctured, well, they tend to evaporate over time. I've got a nice little fire, Swedish fire steel, and these things are great. I was wondering why the Swedish fire steel costs so much more than the Coblenz brand. And uh, when you use the Swedish fire steel, it's significantly harder rod, and it throws quite a bit of sparks to it. So I really like the Swedish one. It's you know spending but worth the money. And I also have a quarter inch fuel line. So what the quarter inch fuel line allows me to do is to blow into it like a bellows and get, help me get the fire going. Also in the top pocket, I have a first aid kit. So inside my first aid kit, I have bandaging supplies and basic over-the-counter medicine, anti-diarrheal, um, basic painkillers like acetaminophen, and I also carry a large number of Aquamure water purification tablets. Uh, these water purification tablets are great when you don't have time to stop and boil water for purification. You just fill up your water bottle and add one tablet per liter. And the wait time is supposedly 30 minutes, but I used these when I was hiking uh, Section J of the PCT, and I drank it in 20 minutes, which I don't know if I should have or not, but I survived, barely. <laughs> but uh, it's nice having water purification. Chemical water purification is great. And these aquamarine tabs are made of uh, chlorine dioxide. So chlorine dioxide, if you're not familiar with it, is what the municipal water systems use to purify water. So these have been very safe. I've probably ingested tons and tons of these tablets over the years of backpacking and haven't suffered any ill effects. So the next item I have is a Leatherman, I believe this is a 
you say Leatherman quality is legendary and there's so many things you can get with, done with a multi-tool. It's got a standard straight blade, it's got a serrated blade, it's got various screwdrivers to it, it's got a file and a saw. So there's a lot of things you can accomplish and it's also nice having a pair of pliers when you have to pick up a hot pot or pick up something out of the fire or make repairs to things. So, highly recommend Leatherman. I think I have about three of these and I've been very, very happy with them. Next, I also have a heavy duty half inch thick, six inches long ferro rod. Uh, like I said, ferro rods are great. You can dunk them in water and they still can light a fire for you. And this particular size is probably good for thousands of strikes. Well, probably a few hundred. I think it's kind of a misnomer. They say these ferro rods are good for thousands of strikes, but if you really, really are trying to get a fire lit, I'd say you're going to burn up a decent amount of this rod trying to get a spark down to your tinder. So I'd say a thousand's a bit of it. You know, thousands are kind of an exaggeration. I'd say hundreds, several hundreds of strikes from a ferro rod. But like I said, they're really nice. They can't fail. There's not much to go wrong with them. You can keep them in the water and they're still going to light up when you strike them. So always something good to have. Next item I have is a Silky Saws Gombo A270 with large teeth on it. Like everybody, I went through my bushcraft phase and you know bought a couple of Baco lap banners and realized, well, <laughs> they're okay. But unfortunately, once you go to a Silky, you just don't go back. These Silky Saws, uh, they cut on the post stroke. So they don't cut on the push stroke, which is nice because saws that cut on the push stroke tend to bend when you push them and also can lead to breakage. The silky saws out of all the saws I've tested have been by far the fastest cutting saws I've ever used. Um, they're really nice and not much else you can say about them except they work. They blow through wood. I remember when I first got this saw, I tested it on a uh, four inch thick piece of deadfall that was blocking the road and it blew through it in about 12 seconds. So that was pretty good for a uh, small handheld saw. And I keep the saw in this uh, custom pouch I sewed up for myself. So it has a little piece of molly on the wet back so you can either weave it into a molly or in the configuration I have it in right now, you can use it as a belt loop so you can just wire it on your belt. On the inside mesh pocket here, I have oh, more aqua mirror tabs. Shocking. <laughs> but like I said, you really can't have too many of these. I have an MSR giant aluminum spoon. Um, I really like these long handled spoons. When you're trying to get to the bottom of an MRE or to the bottom of a mountain house freeze dry pouch, a regular spoon will get your hand absolutely messy. So these long extended spoons can let you reach the bottom of the pouch without getting your fingers all dirty. And this particular MSR one has a bunch of cutouts in the handle. 
So you can use it as a gas wrench on various appliances, which I thought was a little gimmicky, but yeah, might come in handy someday. And the last item I have on the inside of my pop, my pouches here, or my bag, is a pair of grabber hand warmers. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, in a cold weather situation, if you lose the ability to use your hands, you lose your ability to do work. And it can become really serious really fast. So these are kind of nice because you can use them as hand, besides hand warmers. Uh, if you or a, somebody you're with are going hypothermic, you can take them to the inside of their armpits and get the, their blood flowing warm, get their blood warmed up and flowing. So hand warmers, absolute lifesavers. You know, these go for about maybe an hour or two and after that they kind of drop off, but they're kind of nice. Once you expose them to air, they get pretty warm pretty fast and, you know, allows you to do more things. and you're going to look back and 
you know, what was I thinking, or I found something better, you know, you can always explain to your equipment, it's not you, it's me, I just want to use other pieces of gear. So, don't be afraid to make changes to your bag. You know, we grow as people, and our skills improve. And as the cliche goes, the more skills you have, the less you can carry. Well, yes and no, it's, you're still going to need equipment to carry out what you need to do. But, as you gain more experience in the outdoors, you got to understand what you really and truly need and what you can make do without or you can make do with. And so your bag is going to be constantly changing over time. One thing I did want to mention to you guys is uh, somebody was asking, what do you do? You're now walking down the road with a camouflage bag. Well, I don't see any camouflage pack, do you? Okay, so weighing this bad boy. Get a weight of Twenty five point eight pounds. So we're at twenty five point eight pounds dry weight, and assuming I carry the full load of water, which would be three liters, that's going to add another six pounds to it. So we're looking at about thirty one point eight pounds, about thirty two pounds. Not the lightest ruck in the world, but I've taken this ruck out and actually lived off of what's in it, and. It was a really comfortable night. Well, in closing, folks, um, some of the things you want to think about. Always remember, comfort and capability is always inversely proportional to weight. So the more comfort you have, the higher your weight's going to be. The less comfort you have, the less weight you have. So. Keep that in mind, you probably want to maintain more mobility versus being comfortable. So, like I said, 32 pounds, not the lightest pack in the world, but based on what uh, all the backpacking, you know, infantry and hiking and mountaineering I've done, it's kind of a good balance for me. This is just my personal pack. Uh, as the old saying goes, your mileage is going to vary. So. I encourage you guys go out and break at least two or three pieces of gear a year. You know, something looks good in theory, but sometimes you have to spend a little bit of money and give it a try and see if it's going to work for you or not. I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, video of my bug out bag, my get get out of town in a big hurry bag. So, if you guys do want to see any specific videos on any of the items in the bag. Please leave it down in the comments. Um, I appreciate if you guys would give a like to the video and please feel free to leave a comment. It helps me improve my videos and it allows me to interact with you guys and answer any questions you guys might have. Thanks again.